Good morning, everyone. My name is Todd Arbogast. I'm professor of mathematics at the University of Texas at Austin. Is this not on? <laughs> but that's the point of a microphone. <laughs> So I am also at the Odin Institute. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's plenary speaker, Professor Mary Bennett Wheeler. She is well known in the uh, scientific community, especially for the numerical solution of coupled partial differential equations. In particular, the large scale modeling of multiphase reactive flow and transport and geomechanics, geological porous media. Her work is characterized by rigorous mathematical developments, real world applications, and interdisciplinary collaborations. At times, Mary will come into my office and confide to me privately that perhaps some student, perhaps some colleague, doesn't seem to have that fire in the belly. I think it is safe to say that anyone who has ever met Mary Wheeler knows that she has fire in the belly. Her passion, curiosity, and vision have been an inspiration to me and perhaps to everyone she has come in contact with. She is being honored by five mini-symposia dedicated to her at this meeting. Professor Mary Fannett Wheeler got her bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Texas at Austin. She, re she earned her PhD from Rice University in 1971 under the direction of the late Jim Douglas, Jr. and Henry Ratchford. She remained at Rice University until 1995, going from the rank of lecturer to the rank of chaired full professor. In fact, she was the first tenured professor in engineering at Rice University. However, she did spend a few years at the University of Houston from 1988 to 1990, where she was also a chaired professor. She has been at the University of Texas at Austin since 1995. She is the Ernest and Virginia Cockrell Chair in Engineering, and she has appointments in three different departments. The, departments, the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics, the Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering, and also Mathematics. She has far too many honors for me to mention them all, but I will mention a few of the highlights. She is a fellow of the IACM. She is a fellow of SIAM. She has been awarded the Computational Fluid Dynamics uh, Award from the USACM. That award is now called the Thomas J.R. Hughes Medal. She won the Theodore von Karman Prize from SIAM, and she won the SIAM Geosciences Career Prize. She has two honorary doctorates, from the Technical University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and from the Colorado School of Mines. She is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And finally, I'd like to mention three awards that she has received. These are the highest awards given by the respective society. She has earned the Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society of Porous Media, Interpor. She has won the highest award from this group, the John von Neumann Medal the, uh, from the USACM. And finally, from the Society of Petroleum Engineers, their highest honor is to make someone an honorary member. And Professor Wheeler is an honorary member of the SPE. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Mary Bennett Wheeler.
Well, <clears throat> I want to thank the uh, committee for inviting me to make this presentation. And I also want to thank all the people, the participants who have uh, giving presentations and the many symposia in my honor. It's just in overwhelming. I'm so flattered uh, for all the activities in this meeting. Anyhow, I would, in my presentation today, I'm chang changing the title slightly, and I'm titling it Modeling and Simulation for Coupling Geomechanics, Flow, and Transport for subsurface applications. Now here, some of these subsurface applications that I'm looking at come in the geosciences, but also a lot of this is applicable to doing biomedical applications. Um, let me go through on the motivation and objectives that we have in, that I have in preparing this presentation. In particular, uh, I'm interested in the coupling of multi-physics and multi-scale for porous media. And I break this up into two categories, core technologies and doing test bed applications. In the, care, in the core technologies, what we are looking at is the preservation of physics, uh, con uh, con uh, conservation, and um, also uh, looking at uh, temporal and spatial issues, as well as uh, high performance computing, uh, doing um, adaptive mesh refinement, and of course solvers. And also, in addition, looking at data extraction, uh, doing data uncertainty, uh, doing uh, data assimilation uncertainty, and sir, uh, also looking at today, uh, there have been so many talks on machine learning. It's another area that is into this core technologies, and at the same time, to try to apply for these core technologies, we need test bed applications. We need this to be able to verify and validate our applications. And now one, if you look at, oh, I went back, let me go back. What's happened here? Uh, one, the objective, uh, in particular one, this has been a theme at uh, ISIS or the UT Odin Institute is to look at, uh, to revolutionize simu simulation by creating high fidelity models, algorithms, and technologies for complex multi-physics, multi-scale, and uh, <clears throat> uh, stochastic problems and to apply these to real world problems. So in the outline for my talk, I'm going to look at two test bed uh, applications. One has to do with carbon sequestration and EOR. The other one has to do with the hydraulic fractures. Then we look at some of the core technologies. And here in the core technologies is to look at the coupling of uh, mechanics and fluids. This could also apply to mechanics, fluids, and an energy balance or thermal. It also is applicable if one is wanting to do, uh, look at uncertainty quantification or if you're wanting to do optimization. And so this is important how we handle the coupling rather than doing this monolithically. Uh, in particular, and when you're adding more and more physics to the problem, to be able to treat things in a decoupled fashion. That's one of, one of the core technology. A second core technology is to look at uh, uh, discretizations. And here I will talk about uh, EG, 
in Rich Galerkin, which is really a simpler version of discontinuous Galerkin, and which I'm finding to be much more robust than DG. Uh, third core technology that I will talk about is some new work that we've done that involves the use of space-time applications. And then I will conclude. Now, I have a list of collaborators. I enjoy collaborating with people. I think it's a lot more fun to talk about problems. And also, it's important because to work in a multidisciplinary environment. And I won't go through all the details on the collaboration here, but I will mention this and this uh, involvement with these different groups through my talk. All right, the first one has to do with the, the use of CO2 carbon storage. And I have cartoons here. Uh, the, on the left one, we have a, a CO2 storage, and on the right, uh, enhanced oil recovery. And so here, what one is involved is injection, for example, in the storage, the injection of CO2 in saline aquifers. And then what one has to uh, involved in modeling is one, the, you have three flowing phases and a solid phase, and how do these interact? Here, what I want to do is describe one of the motivations in when you're modeling carbon sequestration. One, what you're interested in is the continuous CO2 injection. And it, one, one of the difficulties here is that you have plume migration along high permeability zones. You would like to remove it, but somehow you have this involvement into the different layered uh, areas of the, uh, of the reservoir. And so the use of foam has been proven to be f effective for flood conformance. In particular, uh, this reduces the liquid gas mobility ratio. And it also blocks gas migration along high permeability pathways. So if the three pictures you see just using CO2, injecting it, it's not very satisfying. Another one is the use of water alternating gas. You alternate water with CO2. And the third area of the use of surfactants and foams. So let's see how this works. Well, in particular, we were involved in looking at a field in Cranfield, Mississippi. Um, one, a real field with real data. And so one, in this particular scenario that I'm going to describe, we used data from this field. And we had six injection wells. And what we did, because we did not have uh, other data, we were limited in data. We modeled, we wanted to do this study, we modeled adding uh, nine wells for handling boundary conditions on the boundary. So we wanted to see how do these different techniques perform. So here is some data uh, from Cranfield, relative permeability, capillary pressure, this is a realistic picture of the best information we had on the permeability field. And uh, I, I will just list but not go through all the details regarding the PVT data and the other information. It was roughly, this study in each of these was roughly 400,000 elements, grid blocks as the petroleum engineers like to call it. So, in this study, we are looking at doing a, uh, this is an equation of state compositional flow model and involves uh, also, you'll see these different techniques of water alternating gas uh, with and without hysteresis and also surfactant flooding. So here are some pictures and you can see in the first one 
we're looking at the use of just doing CO2 sequestration. Uh, one, the one below was doing water alternating gas. This inf these simulations really show that these two processes really were not very satisfactory. And so let's look at the effect on the next slides where we do actually treat the water alternating gas and put in relative permeability hysteretic behavior, include the hysteretic behavior. And you can see that in both of these two scenarios that there is a lot more CO2 at the bottom of the sector. So in the other two, I will summarize what is happening, is that you can see that in the continuous CO2 injection, 48.2% of the total injected CO2 does not, is not stored, but it's flowing out through the boundaries. One, uh, the CO2 um, from the other two is reduced, in other words, excuse me, is stored. We have only roughly 20% and 8% flowing out. If we include hysteresis and also or, and or uh, surfactant. All right. Now one should ask in that same problem, what is the effect of geomechanics? And so here uh, is another picture, and you can uh, certainly see the impact here of including geomechanics in this model. And this is in the case of the, uh, to the, we added, we did this model. We did it for all three, but in particular, this is in the case where we did SAG, or surfactant alternating gas. And so clearly the volume increases in the case of adding uh, the geomechanics. And also the effects, computational effects, you can see there are differences here in both the cumulative gas produced and the cumulative uh, oil production, as well as this was these computations where we were looking at a specific well. All right. Now, in concluding here, is that uh, the SAG increases storage, CO2 storage volume, and oil recovery um, during the CO2 sequestration or EOR processes. Now, associated with that, we, used, we also couple this code with an optimization software using a genetic algorithm. And so in this case, we saw that by we could actually increase more storage to the effect of about 15%. But in particular, when we do this surfactant case, we have that CO2 storage, or CO2 storage, 60% less water and surfactant were consumed. That's very important if you're uh, in Texas or uh, certain dry states. And um, anyhow, certainly in these studies, the coupling of the mechanics and fluids is very important. Now, the test bed uh, two that I want to look at is uh, fracture propagation. And here we're looking at software IPACs. Oh, I should mention on this work on CO2 sequestration, this work was done with uh, one of my graduate students, Cherry Liu. All right, on test bed two, on fractures, uh, clearly the used fracking is uh, continuing to grow in importance, uh, and especially in the U.S. Maybe not in Europe, but in the U.S. Anyhow, this, these plots show how this has increased, and in fact, if you look at uh, well, the plots, if, I'm not sure if you can see it in the back, but there is Eagle Ford, and that's where, that's an area where I was raised. Unfortunately, I have no, none of my land is in uh, that uh, zone. Anyway, uh, 
One, I want to talk about a phase fill approach, and I'm going to go through this very quickly because this is what we've used. Uh, phase filled, one, you've seen this uh, before, is that um, one where you have a fracture and then around each fracture you compute this diffusive zone where this this phase field variable is, for example, we have that phi is zero in the fracture and phi is one outside the fracture. And so all this work, and this, a lot of this was work has been done with uh, Andro Mishlik, Thomas Wick, and, and sang Hu Lee. Uh, in particular, our idea has been to push this and to one better understand fractures and the inter and in fact in some of the slides I'm next going to show involve the intersection of hydraulic fractures with natural fractures. This is very important, but the idea is to push this to look and couple these fractures with uh, uh, production. So I'll just for completeness sake, I'm not going to go through this because I've seen many presentations on this. Uh, in particular, the approach, this phase field approach, is a variational method based on energy minimization. And I list here the classical theory of fracture propagation, the diffusive crack zone, geomechanics modeling, phase field for fractures, and hydraulic fractures in porous media. And then how the uh, the bottom of the slide, what the energy uh, functional that we minimize. Uh, I won't go into those details, but I'd like to go over uh, here what are the advantages of phase fill approach. And in particular, crack propagation uh, is automatically determined by this energy minimization. The joining and branching of non-planar cracks are simple to handle for, <clears throat> uh, and, uh, and also we, for two, and this is true for two and three dim dimensions. Computationally robust verification and validations are available. And I won't go through the many papers have been done on this. And in particular, we can treat this in a multi-scale and multi-physics uh, extensions. Um, and so let me show you some examples. Here is a 3D example. Here shows the fracture, uh, the Young's modulus, adaptive mesh. So you can use very heterogeneous parameters. Uh, and then, like I say, you can do it in 3D. Here, one, some of the well-known concerns or issues involving uh, the use of the shadow effect. Uh, this is work that has been done. These computations were done uh, with uh, uh, Lee and Wick. And uh, so here's some of the standard, some of the standard concerns or examples. Another, like I say, more recently, what we have looked at uh, with Sang Hyun Lee is the use of the intersection between the natural and hydraulic fractures, better understanding these effects. So in this particular example, we have uh, two at the top and bottom. We have two natural fractures. We do a hydraulic fracture. And you can see how this hydraulic fracture goes and meets the natural fractures. And also, in fact, what you see is on the right, you see how the pressure increases the pressure increases as the hydraulic fracture reaches the natural fracture and then it drops off. So trying to understand, there's a lot of work that's been done on this and in particular some of the uh, examples by uh, John Olson and his graduate students, we match very similar type problems. Uh, another is what when we have uh, a lot more fractures, 
one and say you look at one fracture, but you have a lot, I mean, in other words, you have a lot of natural fractures, and then you do uh, use a hydraulic fracture. How does this hydraulic fracture intersect this whole collection of natural fractures? And so here you have a uh, picture on the left where we have a lot of natural fractures. We hydraulic fracture as indicated on the slide. And then we look at, for example, how does that fracture, uh, so in fact, let me list there. Here's A, I'm gonna show, list three natural fractures. There's A, there's B, and there's C, and let's see how does this uh, hydraulic fracture intersect those natural fractures. And so in each of those cases, you can see as in this plot here with pressure, that as the natural fracture, as the hydraulic fracture reaches the natural fracture, the pressure increases and then it drops off in each of the cases A, B, and C. Another thing, one in the uh, phase field approach, what we see is from the formulation that the width of the flat, the width of the fracture, one does not go back to the original width. But if one looks carefully uh, at the calculations before you do flow back, you find that in fact that the width does decrease. Another area that we've looked at in this phase field with respect to fractures is to look where you have a probability map and one that once you, from this probability map, you can determine where are the, you have a guess on where these fractures are located. And so here, this is again some work with Song Hu Lee, uh, we have an SPE paper on this, is where you take and you look at how you have three different, uh, you div different stages and you look at how these fractures, how the hydraulic fracture intersects the natural fractures. Another interesting thing about phase field was, is the fact that uh, which I find is one of the advantages of phase field is that in this being able to model this fracture, you can also add, uh, you can also look at adding um, propen and look at, uh, so here in this phase field model, what we do is add propen. We, in fact, uh, there are polymers. We solve the flow and the fracture is done solving a power law model. And so here, here is the case with the, where you can see the propen. We have a prototype and one of the things is we're looking at trying to really come up with a more realistic propen model. All right, one here in this model, we use how we couple a very complicated flow, and in particular in the first example, we were looking at compositional model, 3D, and including mechanics, including foam, surfactant, I won't go through, just even adding surfactant, makes this highly, highly nonlinear, and especially including hysteresis. So one issue that one has is how do you do this coupling? And so one of the issues, and it's, this has been going on for a very long time in the petroleum industry, the use of mixed methods, uh, the use of decoupling, doing fixed stress was introduced uh, a number of years ago and has really, uh, one, come to play in many applications today in coupling flow and geomechanics. And so I list an incomplete list on the iterative coupling because fully, fully coupled can be very costly. Uh, one way or loose coupling, explicit coupling is not very accurate. And so one, one can show that you have a contraction mapping. 
This is based on some work that I did with Andro Mishlik, and there is a whole collection of other problems. But I want to show, uh, mention something about fixed stress. In other words, you assume a fixed stress, uh, one, you, um, one couple, you couple, you cu uh, compute pressure, then you compute displacements, and you do this in an iterative fashion. So in particular, I won't go through all the details, but I would like to mention that there is this result that I did recently with Vivette Giraud uh, and two, uh, two former PhD students, that namely, that if in this iteration, you take, there is a criteria, if you do a fixed number of iterations and you satisfy this boundary, you satisfy this condition, then what you have is you get optimal order convergence. You can't do better. So one, some more recent work is that we have uh, looked at extending fixed stress to what we call three-way coupling. And in three-way coupling, one, what one does is that you can bypass the geomechanics step. If you satisfy certain criteria, similar to the one for the convergence of the fixed stress, that one doesn't have to solve the geomechanics step. And so uh, basically, let me show you some results. I won't go through any of the theory, but you can prove that this also works is in three-way coupling, here is the traditional Mandel problem that one does. And in fact, we compare this, the pictures at the top show that we do fixed stress. There's also an analytic solution. And we also do three-way coupling. And everything sits on top of each other. But if you look co closely, you see there is, and I, my glasses are not strong enough here, that, in, that the CF time, the, uh, the computational time goes from something like 617 to, uh, you probably see on the screen better than I can, 238 or something. But anyhow, substantial cost reduction. So here is a case where we're doing three-way coupling. This is a compositional model. And you can see the solutions look very, very similar. Uh, one, here we have another slide where you can see, for example, three-way coupling for a compositional model. And again, I'm comparing at a fixed well location. And again, there is substantial case coupling, I mean, cost for savings here. Uh, in this case, from like uh, 36 to, in other words, an order of magnitude. Also, uh, here we do, uh, this is with SAG, the, the, the next one, excuse me, I didn't, here, well, let me get back up here. Here we do, that's, uh, uh, here is the uh, three-way coupling for the surfactant. So, and in fact, that's even more complicated. So why this uh, decoupling is so important is when you really uh, couple this with very complicated nonlinear flows. And uh, here, again, in the case of the uh, three-way coupling, you see, again, they match up between the fixed stress and the three-way coupling. All right, let me go quickly to the coupling of flow and transport. Uh, one, uh, there are many different locally conservative flow and transport. Uh, I think that if one looks at, uh, I know a number of lectures, even at this meeting, where I've seen is that uh, one wants, when you are doing the O system and you're doing flow, you want locally conservative flow. That it really, you get much, much better results if you have a conservative procedure. 
And so here I have listed a number of well-known approaches. And uh, certainly I've worked on discontinuous galerkin almost from the beginning of my career. Uh, enriched galerkin was a procedure that was introduced by uh, Xu Yu Sun, one of my former students and one of his collaborators back in 2009. Again, uh, what uh, Sang Hu Lee and myself have pushed this because one and with another collaborator is the fact that you can find good solvers for, in, for EG, for the enriched glurkin. It's locally conservative, has many fewer unknowns. And um, one, we have added to this, this instead of doing slope limiting, using enriched, um, excuse me, doing this uh, entropy vanishing viscosity for doing, for adding more uh, uh, smoothness or for treating uh, more sharp fronts. All right, here is a picture of the enriched galerkin. You take continuous galerkin. And to that, you add piecewise discontinuous constants. If you wish, you could also add piecewise discontinuous linears. We've actually used this procedure in doing elastic wave propagation. It really has nice properties. I find it, in the case of multiphase flow, to be much more robust than DG. DG, I have to handle very, treat very carefully. What are some applications uh, for this? Uh, let me go back here. Here are some applications. Well, I don't know why. It, let me go back. I keep. Now, here we go. Here you see miscible displacement. Uh, and the reason we actually got involved in Rich Galergan was that we wanted to look at propane transport. So here you see f dis different phys uh, fingering effects. Uh, anyhow, I think it's a very robust approach. Let me go now to my next core technology. This is some very recent work uh, that is on space-time discretization. Uh, in trying to model multi-phase flow, uh, one, one has problems. You have actually to try to put grid, fine grid around wells. Another difficulty you have is you have sharp saturation fronts due to uh, the chemistry, due to the, the nonlinearities and the chemistry, as well as um, uh, the, uh, you know, like the flow going through small elements. And so one has a lot of trouble with the nonlinear solver. Nothing I hate is to be doing a simulation, it's going fine, and then you have to cut the time step and cut the time step and cut the time step. And so one, because in uh, this work has been done with mixed finite element methods, but similar results, and we're looking at a similar approach for using enriched galerkin. But here, what one would like to do is to be able to take and do the refinement where it's needed. And that refinement, when you do that refinement, you need also take a smaller time step. And so what we have here is this combination of doing space and time, and where we do refinement, we're going to cut the time step. So here is, uh, again, this motivation of doing multi-scale and multi-physics. And you can su see some of these pictures with fronts where we want the grid where it is. Well, what quickly, we have a strategy. And the idea is to ply the fine grid where it is needed uh, and to um, so here, if you look at the strategy, uh, apply uh, time steps. In other words, we're going to try to start with a grid. We're going to try to determine the grid based on the time steps, taking smaller time steps 
and then we come back and we do spatial refinement and then one after that's passed then, then we take another time step so we're using what is known as the enhanced velocity method so there are many talks in uh, the sessions honoring me on mixed methods the enhanced velocity method is a very nice way of doing adaptive meshes using mixed finite element methods and so on the left here I show uh, the enhanced velocity the scheme the discretization scheme and below I show all the different time steps capabilities and this work I want to point out that what I'm talking about on space time was done by Hong Yu Lee one of my graduate students and Win Tat Luong who has been a postdoc in our group now one what I want to point out and you may not be able to read this is the error estimators. We have error estimators for this. And our, again, uh, the work of Morton Vorlick, and I did a paper with him in the very beginning. Anyhow, one is that um, uh, one that you have a metric and you want to abound, you want to bound this metric. And so what we did in these error estimators don't have much time is that we come up with spatial and time temporal error estimators uh, also for the residual and for also for for the flux and so we use these estimators in our computations and so I'm going to go through this quick because my time's running out here is the error estimators the temporal for temporal and spatial for the residual and also temporal, temporal and, and flux, uh, temporal and uh, spatial for the flux. And so here, here quickly is a uh, Gaussian. When we're doing, we have the permeability is Gaussian. Uh, and you can see how things are um, done homogenization. Let me go through some more. Here is the uh, where we here's data that we've used in these numerical experiments and here is the adaptive this is for the Gaussian case so it's changing space and time uh, one if I look at this in a static picture you have this picture that you can see the effects let me go to the uh, channelized which is much more complicated uh, than the Gaussian and here uh, one goes through doing the adaptivity and uh, both temporal and spatial uh, one I want to point out that the production theory for the two this is the case of the channel flow. If you did the Gaussian, they are even closer together. But in the channel, you have very good, very good uh, matches. And so I want to comment that on the uh, case, what I'm showing you here is the incompressible case, but there's also host for compressible. It's really hug holes for a gas oil. That's a tough problem. So this is only two day, two D, two phase. But if you can do gas and oil, it's been my experience that you can do black oil without any problem. Anyhow, uh, I want to uh, look at concluding. I want to say I've talked to you about IPARS, about how we have. Um, used IPARs for doing uh, some very complicated uh, compositional flow models. In fact, we have, uh, we foam nanoparticles. It's very sophisticated code. It's been coupled with geomechanics. We've coupled it also to do optimization, both in genetic, also doing ensemble column and filter. 
We've also uh, looked at the case of uh, hydraulic fracturing and one, how it has can be applied in, uh, for example, uh, number of, we've done number of applications. I've just presented a few here, but in particular, it can handle also treating uh, propot, the introduction of propot. Uh, one, uh, I've mentioned enriched galerkin, which I see to be much more, in my opinion, more robust than discontinuous galerkin, and also looked at uh, the decoupling of flow mechanics, and you can do also this with thermal, and this is useful for many different scenarios. And then finally, in space-time, at least I've shown some recent pictures that show that this has really, I'm very optimistic about the use of this approach for doing, uh, for really doing uh, uh, space time for these problems. Now in future works, this kind of in a certain sense summarizes. Uh, one, I started out with looking at stored carbon storage and EOR. And then I went to the next application, was hydraulic fracturing. Well, what do you think is going on today in hydraulic fracturing? A lot of oil is left behind. What do you think people are interested? They're interested, how can we now apply enhanced oil recovery? How can we apply some of these techniques to doing uh, hydraulic fracturing? So the idea of using surfactants, injecting surfactants, while you are doing the fracking process, the completion process, people are seeing that this is helpful, the experiments are very helpful, as well as in the treating of flowback. So in particular, being able to couple uh, some of these techniques with fracking is really an area of research. Another interesting thing is that uh, another topic I think is really interesting. What I tried to say is that one, we use ENKF, we use genetic algorithms. Well, here are some big problems where this is needed, trying to do machine learning, data analytics, doing optimization for treating these types of, these are real challenges. Can we do this with data? analytics and machine learning. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a real honor.